Greetings everybody around the world. It's time once again for Ancient Aliens Radio. This is the dedicated radio show for the cast of Ancient Aliens. Here we interview authors and researchers as an ongoing investigation into the ancient alien theory. Don't forget to like us on Facebook or subscribe to the YouTube channel Ancient Aliens Radio. I'm delighted to have a returning guest today, Mr. Reverend Michael Carter. And uh, a little bit of bio on Michael. He is super interesting and he started life as an actor, also an interfaith minister. And uh, he's got a master's in divinity degree from the Union Theological Seminary in New York City. And uh, he also is a staff chaplain at Lenox Hill Hospital, Beth Israel Hospital, Beth Israel Cancer Center, Methodist Hospital and New York Hospital in Queens, whilst residing in New York. He's also serving various Unitarian Universalist congregations in New York. Um, Michael was trained as an anti-racism trainer and has been recognized by President Clinton for his efforts. Michael was also a weekly com- columnist for the Asheville Citizen Times. And he's a long-time UFO contactee. Michael is also famed for Ancient Aliens TV on uh, the History Channel. Um, Michael's also uh, a Reiki master as well, which I want to mention a little bit today. Um, I think it's another little fascinating aspect we never really concentrated on in previous shows. So uh, without further ado, let's bring on our guest today. Hi, Michael. Hey, brother. Good to hear from you. Oh, good to hear from you too, Michael. And we have a new book, which is why we're here today. We're going to talk about your new book, A New World, If You Can Take It. I'm um, glad to see it in print, uh, Michael. Uh, you've worked hard on it. A fascinating book. It's an intellectually refreshing book from an intellectually refreshing soul. Um, I'll say that from the outset. Um, of course, with our previous show, Alien Scriptures, it's, it's, I can see where you've gone with the book, Michael, and uh, gone in this direction. Yeah, you know, it was, I wanted to, uh, I don't want to say get the religion part out of the way. I, I put some stuff in the book where people who either didn't read uh, alien scriptures or if they, if they didn't read it, they would kind of be caught up. And then I wanted to take it to the next phase because I believe that in order for human beings to go to the next stage of evolution, we're going to have to stop looking outside of ourselves for answers and start looking with within and mm. religion and this is going to sound strange coming from a, a clergy person <laughs> you know it, it can be not all the time so if listeners are listening i'm not saying all the time but it can be used more to separate us than it can to bring us together no for sure i totally agree with you michael and um I think you've done a, a great service in the book, and uh, I think you've nailed a, a few themes, concepts, if you will. Uh, great historical background, too. Uh, great uh, background with the scriptures as well. Um, I guess uh, maybe just talk a little bit about the Sankofa philosophy that you talk about at the start of the book. I think this is very fascinating, and it kind of brings us into some of the theme of the book. Oh, yeah. It, well, it's an old African uh, saying uh, it's good to Sankofa. Sankofa. And what it means is that we, it's Sankofa. And it means we have to look, We, in order to move forward, we have to look back. Mm. It doesn't mean that we have to live in the past, but it does mean we can learn lessons from the past in order to move on into the future. And so, you know, you, there's an old African-American saying, you never forget the bridge that brought you over. And so it may not, the bridge may not work for you anymore, but you still needed it. Well, with Sankofa, it, 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 it's looking back, and we do it all the time, I think, mm-hmm. uh, in order not to make the same mistakes or in order to, to get new insights. And I think it's very, very, very important um, that, well, the Dalai Lama, James, I remember listening to him, and he said, for instance, Let's say you were a Buddhist or a Christian or, you know, a Muslim or what have you. And let's say you left your faith because maybe you found a new faith. Mm -hmm. He said, never talk bad about the faith that you left, because even though it doesn't work for you anymore, it still may work for other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a very simple thing. But how many people do you know that, oh, I don't believe that anymore and yada, 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 yada. Well, you know, but you can't, 
every every journey that we took in the past makes us the person we are today. And so you can look, one can look back and learn from that sure. and move forward at the same time. Wow. Again, leads us to the book, A New World If You Can Take It, uh, God, Extraterrestrials and the Evolution of Human Consciousness. Michael, we're looking back at the past again. We're looking for answers and a lot of yes. people, a lot of people are opening up to this now. A lot of people are looking in this direction. Um, this is like a rediscovery process, Michael, as opposed to a discovery process. You, you, you hit it on the head, James. You know, and I was one of those people, for instance, uh, I, I threw I threw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, I said the Bible is is it's all uh, you know BS and the stories aren't true and you know who cares? And and but I had to take a second look at it. I'm a man of the West, mm. and by that I mean I'm shaped by Western culture. Maybe if I lived in in you know in the Middle East, it'd be uh, I'd be a Muslim, or if I lived in the Far East, I would be a uh, a Buddhist or, or or Hindu or what have you, but the thing is, is that no matter how how I try to get away from the Bible, it, those teachings always came back to me, and I had to to revisit them in order to make them pertinent for today, because I th- I think I I don't think I know at least for me that there's a lot of wisdom in those books. Mm-hmm. Uh, in those stories. And then if you add the extraterrestrial component, to me, it even enhances it. Uh, and so I didn't, I had to go back and say, what, what am I doing? I'm throwing out all this stuff because either I don't agree with certain things or they may not have happened the way I thought they should happen or they've been contradictory. Wow, well, for sure. I had to grow, I had to grow up. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I think that's what you, and you alluded to this later in the book as well, when you talk about the 21st century perspective being important. Um, and why not? You know, why not look at this with a 21st century perspective? Because it, it makes answers. It makes simpler, it simplifies some, you know, really bizarre, strange facts in the, in the scriptures, Michael. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, here we are. Our ancestors were dealing with technology and beings who were just, some of them were really advanced. Some of them were more technolo- technologically advanced, but maybe not so much spiritually advanced. Mm-hmm. And so they mistook these people for gods. Not that they were stupid, not that they were ignorant, but we do that today. I mean, we, as a culture, we worship technology. Mm-hmm. We're in awe of technology. And so um, they, they were overwhelmed. But now we can look back because we see what's happening in our skies and we say, wow, this must be what they were trying to explain to us. Mm. Totally agree. The language that, that they knew of their day. Sure. Totally agree with you. I was holding a conversation the other day, Michael, and, and explaining about the left brain world that we're encouraged to follow this worshiping technology. You know, we think we yeah. have these big telescopes and we have our flat screens and, as John Anthony West says, the stripy toothpaste and our nuclear bombs, and we think we're the most advanced thing ever. But, you know, like I say to people, this technology there, use it wisely, just use it, but don't worship it. You know, don't worship it. You know, once you start doing yeah. that, once you start doing that, you're just going, so there's no balance in that. There's no balance in that. Um, well, you know, you, you, you're right. And, and, and the thing is, is that, and, 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 you know, people have been telling us this for ages, whether it was Dr. King or, other great men and women, they, you know, our we don't have the spirituality to deal with the technology that we have because we just take and make weapons, mm. yeah. uh, uh, you know, and and that we get we get technology whether it's from crashed discs or what have you, and instead of maybe use, using uh, uh, working with free energy or using it to feed the world, we make weapons from it. So it, it goes to show you how immature we are. Mm. But in the book, you know, I, I, I use the title, I talk about how I got the title, but it is going to be a new world if we can take it, mm. if we can grow up enough. Mm to become part of the galactic community. I think that's what you allude to in the book when you, you lay out your, your premise in the, in the book itself and uh, you say, you know, you've got a couple of reasons for writing this book. 
Um, yes. Maybe just expand on that, the maturity of God, and then also learning about the past as well, Michael. Well, yeah, I think that our concept of God, and I, I, and I want to be respectful, mm -hmm. you know, we look at God like, you know, there's a man up in the sky, it's Santa Claus, who punishes you if you're naughty and rewards you if you're nice. And I think that's a child's view of, 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 of the creator and that we use, we make God in our image. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this God is jealous. This God gets angry. Uh, and, and we do see that in the Bible. We see that Yahweh is, 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 is a bloodthirsty, uh, uh, being, a lot of temper tantrums, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But, if we if we look at the Palladian form of spirituality, one among many, mm -hmm. one among many, uh, that 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 God, what well, they call it, creation, is all that is. It's not anthropomorphic. Uh, it's an energy. It's 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 a way of being in the world. It's 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 it can be personalized, but but there's certain laws. If I jump off my roof. The law of nature says I'm going to go splat. There, but there are ways we can work with the law. How? Well, by treating people the way we want to be treated. What you put out comes back. You reap what you sow. It's karma. These are natural laws. Mm -hmm. And if we observe nature, and if we be still long enough, we'll realize that we're, th there's no God outside. This this is everywhere, mm. and we're part of it. Sure, yeah, I, I actually really enjoyed that uh, in the book, not for any extraterrestrial uh, uh, connotation, Michael, uh, but the pleading spirituality, because I like it as a philosophical <laughs> grouping of ideas. Uh, you talk about oneness, balance, eternal spirituality, truth, equality, love. Self responsibility. Now, these, this is a beautiful, uh, this is a beautiful blueprint or mandate for us to, or a code to live by. You know, why not? It, it really is. It really is. It really is. Why not? Like, you know, I mean, if the time was right for it, Michael, it's now. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think the point is though, even if you're not into ET or UFOs or, or any of the, confusing diffusion out there that's going on and and i mean even if you're you know a non-believer or an atheist or whatever you know it, there's still some really interesting you know stuff in the pleading spirituality concept and and, and you know it's it's it, it might seem like common sense but it's in practice it's not there michael in practice it's not there it's hard to do it's difficult i mean it, it's it's difficult to not respond to other people's ignorance uh, with ignorance. It's difficult to take the high road. It's difficult to, to raise your vibration. But the messages that I get is that human beings have to go to the next stage of evolution. Mm -hmm. and, and we have to wait, raise our vibratory rate. And how do we do that? By learning to love. Mm -hmm. not, not, not the love that says we're all going to sing Kumbaya and that we're all going to hold hands and, you know, no, that's not, that's impossible. But the love that says, I respect you for who you are. We don't have to think alike. We don't have to look alike to love alike. Sure, sure. You, you state in the book that you don't like the word aliens. Uh, you actually prefer other terms. Maybe explain that for us, Michael. Well, I, I think it's derogatory. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, there are a couple terms I don't like. I don't like the term abductee. I don't feel like I was abducted. Uh, I don't like the term alien. I think maybe star visitor, mm -hmm. uh, star person. Even if you want to use the word extraterrestrial, that's fine. But, I mean, look, they're, they're human beings on planet Earth that no one wants to be called an alien. You're an outsider. Mm -hmm. You're different. Now, of course, they're different in ways, but they're not different that they don't deserve the same uh, respect, mm -hmm. uh, the same compassion, the same, uh, uh, you know, just the, the same way you would treat a neighbor, mm -hmm. if you will. Uh, and, and so I think that if we... If, if we can maybe just even just find new terminology, it may help us 
to slowly evolve and not to see people as separate. I mean, they're 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 from creation. Mm -hmm. They may some of them look bizarre. Obviously, they don't all live here on planet Earth, but they're still part of creation. And if you're part of creation, then you deserve the respect. You you don't have to earn it. You get it sure. because you are a being. Sure. Hey, we got some weird creatures in this planet that people put in cages and, 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 and love them. So, you know, it's like, you know, if somebody looks different or somebody looks normal, I don't think that's a, I think that's a valid point, you know, and, yeah. um, I think you're right. It's a politically correct way of, uh, treating the, this, in, the issue. Um, Michael, I just wanted to mention the Reiki thing as well at this point because I think it's great to explore your diverse and grounded character. Um, Tell us a little bit about your Reiki. Uh, it's it's quite it's something I've been uh, it's something I've been introduced to in about the last couple of years. I wasn't aware of it in my earlier days. But um, tell us about the different. You're trained in UC and Kerunaki. Tell us a little bit about that, Michael. And well, the, the Yusui method. Yeah, that that's the, was, well supposed to be the original lineage. Well, but I, I will tell you this. Um, I, I started out as a Reiki master. Uh, you know, I took all the training mm -hmm. and I used I used it in hospitals. I had a personal practice. But when I started having my experiences, mm -hmm. um, whatever it was just got stronger. Now, I say it's Reiki because, that you know, it's hard to explain to people. But it's, it's a much stronger energy. And I think the energy is stronger because whenever I get contact, mm -hmm. the first thing that happens is my energy changes. Wow. Because their energy has changed. It's such a, a high vibratory rate. Um, but it's, it's, it's an old, uh, uh, healing modality. Uh, legend has it that, uh, uh, it, it's rediscovered, uh, that Dr. Yusui, you now they're different stories, but, um, he was, uh, he was supposed to be a Christian or very interested in Christianity and he wanted to find out what type of healing Jesus and the disciples were doing. Mm -hmm. And so he came to this country and went to the University of Chicago back in the 1880s, I think. This is one story. Mm -hmm. And he went back to, uh, to Japan. And as on his way back to Japan, he stopped off in Tibet and he met these monks. Mm -hmm. They were saying, man, we've been doing this for about 5,000 years. Now, there are also some stories that he had a mystical experience and what have you. So there are many different mm. uh, explanations for it. But it is, it, it, it's it's a science. You don't have to believe in God or anything like that. Um, and, and Ray means universal. Qi means energy. Chinese call it Qi. Um, it's energy, mm. like everything is. And uh, you go through something called an attunement process. You can send it to people. You know, you know, you can do distant healings on people. I love it. I, I and I use it, mm. but I just know I have a good friend who's a healer. Uh, her name is Rose Marie Starr, and uh, she came to me, and she's very sophisticated in her. Uh, she can really recognize different energies. Mm -hmm. And anyway, she gave me the privilege of doing a couple sessions on her, and she said, "Michael, this is not Reiki. What you're doing." This is really something really, really strong. And I I said, okay. I said, but it's hard for me to explain that to people. She said, fine, tell them you do Reiki. Tell, tell them you're a spiritual healer. But this this is very, very, very strong energy. And I got it from my, my star friends. Wow. Wow. I mean, I got the energy from them. Because every time I see them, um, I, you know, I, 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 I get by on less sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't need to, to sleep as much. I my my hair my hair and my my nails they grow much faster. Wow, than they used to do. Uh, I, I feel like I I'm, I'm I'm definitely more psychic than you know, I'm more intuitive than I used to be. Those are the physiological uh, uh, changes that are definite since I've been having you know visits. Um, my, I think my spirituality has been accelerated sure. and by that i mean um for instance it's much easier for me now to say i'm scared or to say i'm sorry or to say i don't know um i don't mind doing that i don't i i don't have to be right all the time 
I, I, you know, uh, that's part of my maturing process. Um, I, I live life less fearfully. I don't, I don't buy into the separateness, uh, uh, that, that, that the culture, uh, really stresses. You know, someone's tea party and you're not, or they're gay and you're straight, or I don't, I don't get into all that because I know there's a oneness. I also feel a, more of an affinity with nature. You know, I don't, I, 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 I don't believe in the separateness anymore. Not that I ever really did, but even on deeper, deeper levels, I get it that what I do to you, I do to myself. What I do to this planet, I do to myself because we're all connected. Mm -hmm. We really, really are. Michael, you're also trained in the medicine Buddha traditions. Can you elaborate on that a little bit too? Well, there was a, um, it's a different attunement process, but it's a, it's called medicine Buddha Reiki, and and basically someone who's trained in this will give you the attunement. It's all about raising your vibration, mm -hmm. so it's just another level of Reiki, but it's very very powerful, and um, and of course I have a medicine Buddha in my house. It just reminds me of when I meditate, just just that really life is about. It's, it's, it's about healing. It's about healing and being healed. It's about reaching out and being connected, mm -hmm. whether you're an atheist or whether you're an evangelical Christian or what have you. You, you, you know, you, we have to learn to get beyond those boundaries to realize that there are no boundaries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, fascinating, Michael. You know, the reason I mention that too, Michael, is to give a bit of depth of character to you for the listeners and to show that you're diverse outside the theology. Uh, it just branches into a practical and a healing sense too. And uh, I think the, you're a fascinating character, Michael. You really, really are. Um, you know, to come back to the book then, um, yes. you know, you are very well versed in theology, but masses in divinity. Um, yes. Maybe tell us a little bit about the Hindu pantheon of gods and, and how that fits into this kind of picture of aliens. Um, well, well in it's a great question. I, and I, I tell you, and I say it in the book, I think that Hinduism and Catholicism will do very well once disclosure happens. Now, disclosure is happening all the time. Mm. Uh, but some people are waiting for the government to say, guess what? And that may happen. That may happen. It may not, but it may. But... They already have, the, Hin the Hindus and the Catholics, they already have, um, they already deal with lesser gods, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, you know, the Catholics have their saints. And of course, the Hindus have a whole pantheon of gods. They have the, their main deity, Brahman, and then they have lesser deities. Well, that's what we're seeing in the... UFO contactee phenomenon because a lot of these beings will say, yes, there is something called creation or you would call it God or what have you. And we're all part of that. I, and, and so you can see the hierarchy. Yeah. Well, mainline Protestant Christianity, they don't have that. And it's going to be very difficult for them because they don't make room for lesser gods, if you will. Sure. sure. And, and so Hinduism and Catholicism, they, they'll do, they'll do well. They'll do well. Um, so I, but I, I mean, we'll all get around to it eventually, sure. but, but I, I don't think they'll be so stunned. And, and listen, they're not stunned anyway, because they, the Vatican's already talking about, uh, extraterrestrial life and has been since really about 2005. And of course, Hinduism has, the Mahabharata, which is, you know, a story of uh, 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 flying machines, Vimanas they're called, mm -hmm. and their wars in the sky. And so we, we have it right there, mm -hmm. that there there's a life on other planets, and it's visited us here and continues to. Mm. Yeah, the Vatican's really interesting, and uh, I can't remember when I found out, but I, when I found out how deeply involved they are into astronomy, I, I, I sometimes wonder now, in hindsight of the last 10 years, what they really know, how much they know about ET life, um, you know. The they know plenty. They know plenty. Yeah. And, 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 and I think that they also realize that 
this the lid's going to blow off this thing eventually, and they want to be on the right side of history. Hmm. They don't. They want to be in the driving seat uh, before the disclosure comes full on. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can't blame them. Yeah, because, I mean they're out to protect. They're out to protect their faith. Relevant. They want to be relevant. Yeah. And uh, you know, and 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 otherwise, religion will go away. Now the Dalai Lama says uh, that we need to have a different sense of spirituality and ethics that may be separate from religion because right now religions are 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 tearing us apart mm. yeah yeah and I, I mean if you look at if you look at the wars in the middle east yes they're over oil and other resources but they're also religious wars mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I often look at the religious wars, maybe not exclude Muslim for the moment, but I think religious wars, um, you know, it's usually governmental groups using the religion as a bargaining chip or a way to ignite or a way to, you know, exacerbate the situation. However, I think with the Muslim thing, it's more full on in a, in, a, in its sense as a religious war. Um, and you know, the, and, and in fairness, the, the Muslims bite. I mean, look at, you know, look at what's gone on with the, the Arab Spring and that, you know, they just, they just reacted. I mean, I think the whole thing started with Facebook riots. Nobody was questioning where the Facebook, uh, and the tweets were coming from that was igniting all this. Nobody questioned the source. They just responded, you know, and is, you know, maybe it's too easy for, you know, religions to, you know, ignite themselves and, and there's a byproduct of that. And I think inherently each religion on its own is a good thing. If, you know, if, if, it, if it was, there was a maturity about it and some sort of a, you know, an attitude to not reacting or not responding, Michael, perhaps. Well, and I, I think you, you, you hit the nail on the head. And this is why the Palladian, um, now there are other uh, extraterrestrial views, uh, but 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 the Palladian viewpoint is 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 is, is so powerful, and it just makes so much sense. Mm, mm. You see uh, uh, that that our for a lot for a lot of our star visitors, our religions are primitive, mm -hmm. and they're primitive because we use them as a way we fight each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's not what mature people do. Sure. No, that's and it. That's so, it. yeah, in order to grow up, in order to become part of this galactic federation, in order, in order to grow up and be able to embrace other brothers and sisters in the cosmos, we're going to have to really chill out on the violence. Mm. Oh, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Mind. You know, here's the thing. Look, we're talking about a paradigm shift as well. You know, yes, and and here's the thing. For me, uh, I was aware of a paradigm shift in history, not outside any ET or religious um, doctrines, stuff like that. You know, just in purely in a, in an alternative history. I watched the paradigm shift over the last twenty years, where you know alternative historians are now driving the research as opposed to you know academia pick on egyptologists if you like or whatever but you know it's it's also it, it's not just that though it, the, the paradigm shift is across the, the planet it's on levels and spirituality there's an evolving process going on i don't know if it's evolving in the right direction michael or i don't know if it's been misguided in, in another direction i'm talking about all levels of a paradigm shift Perhaps maybe just describe where you think the paradigm shift is today, Michael, in, in your sense, it, it, maybe just particularly with the spirituality and the, and the UFOs. I think the paradigm shift is, 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 is on many levels. But I think what's happening is, and I feel what's happening is, the old way isn't working anymore. You mentioned the Arab Spring. Uh, what's going on in Hong Kong now? People are saying this is not working. We have to go to a different level. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody has to be a, a democratic. Uh, I'm, I'm not in favor of us imposing our social political paradigm on other people. But, you know, there's a new world being born, literally. And it's, it's going through economics. It's going through our spirituality. It's going through the way we treat the earth, you know, with climate change. A new world is being born, but it's painful and it's scary because you kind of don't know. Mm 
<laughs> and, and, and if you're going to hang on to, you know, what's the old saying? Let go or be dragged. Yeah. And so that's what's happening now. And you're going to find souls who are either going to die off uh, or they're going to hold on to the old way of being because that's all they know. But it's, it's no turning back now. Mm -hmm. There's no turning back. We have to go to the next phase of evolution because if we don't, we're going to destroy ourselves. Mm. You know, Einstein says that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Sure. Well, we, we've been doing that, but it's not working anymore. Yeah, yeah. I agree, you know. And in the book, Michael, you, you helped change my perspective on something, so I commend you on that. Let me explain. You, you, you describe in great detail with great examples of how early Christianity was diverse. I was never aware of that. I always thought that Christianity was dogmatic from day one, but it wasn't. It was a very, very, it was quite diverse. And, and that's what I love about the book, Michael. It's, you know, there's great stuff in there. I'm going to get into some more stuff too, but it, it helps change my perspective on things because now I can sit back and I can go, well, a new world, if you can take it, perhaps, Michael, perhaps there is going to be a bit more diversity again. You know, we maybe, maybe that's the thing we should look towards in the paradigm shift, that we're going towards a more diverse, and and respect the full and, and mature outlook. I, yeah, yeah, because you know what the, the thing is, is that because you get to choose. Well, first of all, in the book, you know, it, it, it's, it's pretty diverse until Constantine uh, in 325 and, mm. and uh, you know, the Council of Nicaea. Then Christianity becomes the official religion of the Roman Empire, and so it gets to be political, and you have to believe a certain way. But there's always this fight about who's got the real answers, who's going to be this, who's going to be that. Peter was fighting with Jesus' brother James. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Paul was fighting with, with Peter's brother James, and and uh, uh, because, you know, Paul's saying, hey, you know, I met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And he changed my life. And Peter and Peter and James are saying, yeah, but we knew him. So it's always who's got the right, who's got the true story. But I feel that now people are saying there's a bigger story. Mm -hmm. And that I get to decide how I'm going to be in the world. I get to decide what's going to help make me a more loving, whole integrated, authentic individual, not some priest, not some book, but my own experience. I can learn from nature. I don't have to have a priest tell me what to do. I can learn from my own experiences. And sure, if I want to uh, uh, incorporate the Bible or the Quran or the Dhammapada or the Upanishads, fine. But it's because it's what's, if, if I experience it then it's true for me sure. it's not because you told me it was true sure. it's because i experienced it as true very different way to look at life how is the quran on um, the et concept well first of all they you know they admit when you read the quran and it says, uh, when it talks about Allah, who is Lord of the worlds, plural, mm -hmm. so they're already saying there are other worlds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're already saying there are other worlds. Now, they have what they call the jinn. And the jinn act like angels. They fly. They have, they have, uh, they can shape shift. Uh, they can be very mischievous. Uh, but but they're beings from either another dimension or another world. Now, Gabriel, some of the same characters in the Bible also appear in the Quran. Mm. Miriam, who's Jesus' mother, Mary, uh, uh, Jesus, who's called Isa. Gabriel is the one who tells Muhammad to recite. And he gives him the Quran. Gabriel is a messenger, but we've now. But if you read my first book, you realize that I think all these angels are really extraterrestrials. So Gabriel is an extraterrestrial, 
-hmm. And he is guiding Muhammad and has him recite the Quran. Now, whether or not um, these angels are trying to start a new religion, you know, intentionally, I don't know. But I do know they were trying to give a primitive people some guidelines on how to live a peaceful life. For sure, for sure. I think that's the the great thing that your work points out is the crossovers between some of these religions. Uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh is another great example. Um, the crossover of Gabriel in the Quran. Um, I mean, does none of these religions talk to each other, Michael? Do they not see the crossover? Is that the point? Maybe they don't want their crossover to be in the other one. Well, what? Well, you know, we can't have Christianity without Judaism, and uh, Islam is kind of a, a hybrid. It comes out of Judaism and Christianity. Mm-hmm. So they're all, they're all in the same region of the world. They originated in the same region. And so there's, there's, there's a connection. But you can't see the connection if you're so busy focusing on the differences. It's not to say that the differences aren't there. I know, I, I, I'll give an example. I don't think it's apples and oranges. I have a lot of friends, and they'll say to me, sure. Michael, I don't see color when I look at you. I don't see you as a black person or whatever, or native or whatever. I just see you as a person. Now, I know what they're trying to say. Sure. But, 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 but I say you have to see my color. That's the first thing you see. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't keep us um, from connecting with each other, but to say you don't see a brown man with dreadlocks is intellectually dishonest. I want you to see that. I just don't want you to let that get in the way. Sure. You, you know, and I know what they're trying to say. They're trying to say, I just see you're just a human being. And I am. Well, with the religions, we're so busy focusing on whether Jesus is the true savior and every other religion is really inferior or, you know, you know, you're an infidel if you don't uh, practice Islam the way we say you should practice it. Uh, you know, we, we get caught up into that and that's not what they had in mind at all. Jesus wasn't a Christian. Buddha wasn't a Buddhist and Muhammad wasn't a Muslim. Sure. Sure. Okay, let me lay the big question on you, because I know you have a chapter in the book, and it's probably a good time to mention that, is who or what is God, Michael? Wonderful. I, I, that's the great question. I know, for me, I experience God personally, and I don't, you know, use the word, I like, I like the Palladian word, creation, but I experience this energy is all that is. It is what keeps the universe together, some would say it's love. I would, I would tend to agree with that. Um, you know, I, I, and I, and I think, and I feel that it's good that I don't, I can't give you a definitive answer because the, the, the finite can never comprehend the infinite. Mm-hmm. Whatever I say God is, I'm wrong because it's so much bigger than that. But I can tell you that God is not an astronaut. I can tell you that God is not concerned with who you sleep with or, 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 or what political party you happen to be involved with or what football teams you want to win. It's bigger than that. And it's what holds us together. It's the law of the universe. And Jesus talks about in his Gospels that those who worship, and he calls him the Father, must worship the Father in spirit and in truth. So, it's, it, you know, it's a spirit. It's an energy. Mm-hmm. It, it's, it's not judging you whether you're naughty or nice. The law is that what you put out, you get back. That's not punishment. That's not personal. That's just the way the universe is made up. Sure, sure. Um, well expressed, Michael, well expressed. And I think another thing that I find fascinating in the book is that 
um, you allude to Yahweh and Jehovah maybe not being the same person, uh, the same character. They may not be. I mean, I mean, uh, I also think that when Jesus came back to talk about uh, the father, he was talking about his father, who I think Jesus was possibly a hybrid. But it's almost like he's talking about a different God because the God Yahweh in the, the First Testament, the Old Testament, is bloodthirsty, has anger management problems, mm. uh, you know, is, is very concerned with tribalism. You are my people. I'm jealous. I uh, want you to be circumcised. Don't want you to mix with the other tribes. That doesn't sound like an all-encompassing God to me. I mean, you know, a loving deity. It sounds like someone who's uh, just as greedy and insecure as human beings in a lot of ways. Sounds like half the planet, Michael, <laughs> in a way. But exactly. Yeah. Uh, and so, but you know, you're not... You're not taught to ask those questions. You're not taught to think about, well, if God is God, why would he kill men, women, and children? Why would he have his, his followers do that? And so I'm asking the question, if, is that a God that we want to be associated with? Is it as simple as a scholar, scholarly mix-up, Michael, with the letters YHWH for Yahweh and JHYH for Jehovah? Is it as simple as that? Well, yes, because, because, you know, in, in, in Hebrew, you're not supposed to utter the word of God, mm -hmm. the name of God. So they put these, uh, alphabets there in order, you know, without the consonants there, without the vowels. So you could, you could, you could say it that way. But we could argue that Yahweh and Jehovah are both astronauts. I mean, the Palladians say that Jehovah is, but we do know that they're not God. We do know that they are beings from another world, but not the creator or the creation uh, deity or energy that the Palladians are talking about. And I think we really need to look at that mm -hmm. uh, because we made God into this this man who's going to judge you whether you're naughty or nice. Mm -hmm. That doesn't seem like a mature, um, a mature perspective on how the universe works. Wow. You know, uh, I, something I remember reading in the book, the, you talk about the god Baal, B-A-A-L. Um, yes. Um, you know, even to the Celtic people, some people, the Baal god was Hebrew, by the way, for the listeners, and uh it, to the Celtic people, they used to worship a god called Baal as well. And even where we get the month of May in Irish is called Baal Tine, and Tine means fire, so Baal's fire. Uh, yes. When we celebrate May Day, we celebrate the fire of Baal. Uh, it was a worshipping of Baal. People say that the, some of the ancient Irish may have come from a tribe of uh, Danu or, or Hebrew. I just think it's incredibly, I didn't even, I wasn't even aware of that. Um, so, you know, th this worshipping of you know, gods and, 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 and the creator god, if you want, uh, it's confusing. Um, you know, do you think people are starting to wake up and see that there's a very stark difference here now? That if you read the scriptures and, and, and it's the work for yourself, Michael, and others that are bringing this to the forefront, do you think this civilization is going to be able to make this, you know, connection for themselves? I think they're going to have to, uh, because, you know, these, the, the, these beings are here. They're not going anywhere. They've been here not for thousands of years, but for, well, not for hundreds, but thousands of years. Uh, they, they tell us that they have been involved in, in, in creating human beings, have tweaked us as, at, in different points in history to try to improve on what, what they had created. And this is not saying that there is no creator. Remember, Catholicism has saints and, 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 and Hinduism. Uh, they could have been acting under the auspices or for the greater the greater creator. But you're going to have to go back and look at these stories with new eyes, with an open heart, because these beings are going to have to be incorporated into a new cosmology, a new paradigm shift. So in other words, we're going to have to be looking 
with 21st century eyes. Now, I don't see any other way we can do it mm -hmm. if we want to keep those books to be relevant uh, for us today. And I'm talking about the Bible and the Quran. We're going to have to look at these books in light of the information that we have now about uh, uh, off-world intelligences. Otherwise, um, we're going to be at a loss. Sure. Sure. Uh, Michael, I want to talk about your uh, faith for a moment, just uh, just uh, more out of curiosity than anything. Um, you know, sure. in, in Europe, uh, particularly Ireland, England, Scotland, you know, you, you uh, have a two-party race, if you want to call it that. You've got Protestant and Catholic. And I actually had to look up the other day, Michael, uh, how many different congregations there were. I, I was getting confused and I looked it up. I'm actually shocked how many different types of congregations there are, Michael. Um, so forgive me for not being too knowledgeable in your faith, but uh, tell us a little bit about the Unitarian Universalist uh, congregation. Okay. Um, they started in Europe, but I'll, I'll cut to the chase. And when it came here um, from Europe, Transylvania, uh, they started, we started out as liberal Christians. Unitarians believe in one God. Mm -hmm. They don't believe in Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. Uh, they believe that Jesus was a human being who was an example of how to live a committed life. Unitarian, not Trinitarian, Unitarian. Mm -hmm. Universalists believed that a loving God would not damn you to hell. In other words, Universalists say everybody's saved. Nobody's burning in hell. If God is love, then there's no punishment. There's only the punishment that comes from you doing something untoward to someone else. Because remember, it's karma. What goes around comes around. Now, they merged in 1961. I'm mm -hmm. giving you the truncated uh, version. <laughs> For sure. But, but, those, but those are the basic differences. Unitarians do not believe in the Trinity. And universalists believe that no loving God would damn someone to hell. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the, the Unitarians are the more educated. They went to Harvard, and usually that side came from a more wealthier uh, side. Uh, Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson, was a Unitarian. Mm -hmm. um, uh, now, the Universalists were more blue-collar, and they were they, they were... They were more blue collar people. They weren't going to the great universities and what have you. And we merged. But that's basically the big difference. If you're a Unitarian, you don't believe in a Trinity. We also believe in reason, that you use your mind. You just don't take things on faith. You use your mind. You study. You research. You experience. And we believe that revelation is not sealed. That that new new truths are being discovered every day. It just didn't stop in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation happened and then everything is known. There's no more to know. Mm -hmm. We don't believe that. Mm -hmm. And we also believe that you, you guide your own ship. You create your own theology. Now, what we do believe in, we believe in all the truths of all the religions, we believe that we are connected to the earth. Um, we believe in, in, in the democratic process on how we uh, uh, choose to live our lives. Um, we believe in educating our children. We don't believe in wars and, and those types of things. Mm -hmm. but, but the human being is his or her own boss. They, they, they shape their own religious life not someone else. So when I go to church on Sunday, like I had to speak yesterday, mm -hmm. and, you know, we have Buddhists there. We have people who are atheists. We have people who are Christian. We have well, liberal Christian. We have people who don't know and don't care. We all come together. And, and we always say we don't have to think alike to love alike. We believe in feeding the hungry. We believe in social justice. In, in, in equality and race relations. We have more women ministers in our denomination than uh, probably most of mainline Christianity. Mm -hmm. We had the first woman to be ordained in the United States, mm -hmm. was the Reverend Olympia Brown. She was a universalist minister. Mm -hmm. 
What a wonderful ground and perspective and philosophy, Michael. Uh, really is like um, you mentioned Ralph uh, Waldo Emerson in the book as well. Let's tell us a little bit about his philosophy on this issue. Well, he was he was he was the father of what we call transcendentalism. He left our he left our denomination because he thought we were too Christian. And back at that time, we were. And he he was saying that he got very much into Hinduism and 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 Eastern religions. And he just felt that what I just said to you that the human being develops his or her own spirituality, not someone telling you what to do. And he was just very open about that the answers are not outside of you, that you have to start looking within, because we're not separated from all that is. We are part of it. Mm -hmm. So we're not separated from God. We are part of God. How, How can the creation be separated from the creator? And he was very, he was a maverick. And um, he, 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 he gave a speech at Harvard Divinity School and that, and, and, and he really shook, he shook the foundation of liberal Christianity. And he says, I just can't be a part of this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He gravitated more. So did Henry David Thoreau. Of course, they were contemporaries and he gravitated, they both gravitated more towards Hinduism and what have you. Not so much for the, not so much that they would say I'm a Hindu, but they saw that in the East, there wasn't that separation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that, that kind of heaven or hell and, and who's saved and who's not. It was that, um, that, the God Brahman had different aspects. So this deity may have been the compassionate part of the Brahman. This deity, one deity may have represented the, the destructive part of the Brahman, but that they were all part of the whole. We don't have that in Christianity. Everything is separate. And the belief in separateness is what's going to destroy us. For sure. For sure. Um, you know, uh, I think that's the thing about, not to put Unitarian on a pedestal, a great open perspective and great philosophy, yeah, but there has been other pioneers in other faiths. I think Giordano, Bruno, and, and from a Catholic uh, perspective, um, let's maybe talk about his philosophy on this too, Michael, just to kind of balance the sheets, as they say. Well, uh, uh, Bruno was ahead of his time. He was a genius. Mm-hmm. And basically... He was martyred because he dared to, he dared to, to challenge the party line. That there were possible life on other planets. That, um, perhaps Jesus was not born of a virgin. Uh, perhaps he was just one of many models on how to live, um, a life of integrity how to live a life of compassion and love. And that's simply not what the uh, the church wanted to hear at that time. And so it cost him his life. He was a scientist, and he was arrested in Venice in 1592, and he was tried for heresy in 1593. Mm-hmm. Uh, and again, now the church has apologized for uh, what they did to him, but... You know, what good did that do him? He was 52 years old at the time of his death. He did not believe in the divinity of Jesus, nor did he believe in the Trinity. He did not believe that uh, Mary was a virgin. And, and, and he did not mind voicing those ideas. He thought that the human soul could return to earth in a new body after death. So he believed in reincarnations. He also believed that the human soul would move on to infinite number of worlds besides Earth. I mean, that was just too much for the Inquisition at the time, Mm -hmm. and he paid a dear price for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Michael, we're coming up to the top of the hour. We're going to take a little break. Before you do, uh, can you just give us your website, Michael, um, where people can get a copy of the book? Sure. They can get both books at Amazon or uh, or Barnes and Nobles, you know, it's online, Amazon.com, sure. Barnes and Nobles.com. You can go to my website, which is MichaelJSCarter.com, 
Uh, but you can definitely get both books on Amazon. Oh, wonderful, Michael. Michael, just going to take a quick break and be back in just a moment. Okay. This is your host, James, and I'm talking to Michael J.S. Carter. You can get Michael's uh, personal information bio uh, and his books at michaeljscarter.com. We're talking about A New World If You Can Take It, his latest book. And uh, Michael's previous book is Alien Scriptures, um, talking about uh, alien scriptures in the Bible. Uh, Michael, welcome back to the show. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Oh, good to have you back, Michael. You know, Michael, I just want to talk a little bit, just a little friendly chat. You come back from the uh, Edgar Casey conference. Tell us a little bit about that, what happened there. Well, it was very, very interesting. Uh, first of all, they're a class act. It's called the Ancient Mysteries Conference. I think they have it either once or twice a year. Mm -hmm. I was one of the speakers, of course. The keynotes were Giorgio and uh, Eric Von Daniken. Oh, wow. And what was... What was so great about it was I hadn't done a conference in probably close to 20 years and um, was down in Virginia Beach, lovely weather, hotel right on the beach. Um, just how people were hungry for this type of information. They were hungry for, and, and it was more women than men. At, at, at my talk, there were 280 people, so it was pretty much sold out. People bought the books, but out of those 280 people, 210 were women. Really? Yes, wow. because I talked to a friend of mine about it, and she was saying, she said, Michael, women are not interested in propulsion systems and <laughs> back engineered technology and that kind of thing. True. They want to know about the spiritual transformation, if any, that can occur. And what was also astounding was how many people came up to me and said, you know what, I've had visitations too. I just didn't know who to talk to about it, or I didn't know how to put it into my context. And so a lot of these people there were contactees. And so by having me there, it gave them permission to come out of the closet, if you will. Mm, a platform. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was really wonderful. Wow. Wow, that's awesome, uh, Michael. Awesome. Um, you're still running the Ancient Aliens episodes as well, is that correct? Yes. The, uh, I, we taped some episodes of Season 7 back in July of this past summer, and some of them are airing now. I don't watch it because I don't have cable. If I'm at uh, my friend's house, they have cable, uh, but I don't get History Channel 2. Um, luckily, they'll send me copies, you know, the, uh, the Prometheus Productions will send me copies of the episodes I've been on, sure. but they're already airing now. Oh, awesome. For season seven, yeah. Yeah, I haven't caught the season seven yet, so I look forward to seeing you on it, Michael. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they do a good job. I tell you, I don't know how they did it. I didn't think they could get seven seasons out of this, but they may get a, get another few seasons out of. I think they they train wrecked a couple of seasons and then they came back to grassroots again and just kind of you know. But you've been a veteran of the show, Michael. You've been on quite a few times, and uh, you know it's pertinent to what you do in, in your in your work, Michael, and it's pertinent to the show as well. It's a major it's a major element to the whole um, ancient alien um, hypothesis. So. Well, I, I'd like to think that that I'm, I am making a difference. I, I, you know, I, you're helping me. I mean, hopefully, people will say, "Boy, I'm curious about this." Is a minister writing about religion and and extraterrestrials? So hopefully, people will go out and buy the book. You provide, and others like you, a forum for ancient astronaut theorists, for people like myself, to really help people um, to, to to find other sources. Of knowledge. I mean, you know, in the book I talk about Gnosticism, and that's that that's the the philosophy of knowing yourself, of of going within, as opposed to uh, uh, going without. And it's hard to do that in a world where there's so much noise. It's hard to sit still when you're on your iPod, or when you're on your cell phone, mm. or when you're on your tablet. And the only way to kind of cultivate that is to be countercultural 
and to learn to be still, sure. learn to meditate, even if it's for three to five minutes a day, just to learn and listen to that still small voice within you. Sure. Yeah, you know, I think you're right. I think there's, you know, I think there's a, some sort of a revivalist movement for Gnosticism uh, to come back and um, maybe tell us a little bit the history of Gnostic uh, Gnosticism, Michael. Well, for, you know, I just want to say, first of all, I don't think it ever went away. Sure. I think that what it did was it went underground. Yeah. And basically it was a group, you know, a group of uh, of people, and well, you can have it in any religion, who just went against the grain, who were saying that, you know, I uh, uh, there's an ancient knowledge that I know, or I need to trust myself and not listen to the, I mean, of course they were persecuted, uh, like like many people are who don't toe the party line. But the main uh, motto of the Gnostic was to know yourself, to know thyself. And that attitude, that type of philosophy, even today. Now, in 1979, Elaine Pagels, who was a, a professor of religion at Princeton, she wrote a book called The Gnostic Gospels. And it was an important book because it revealed the tension among the various Gnostic groups um, who became champions of what Christianity became during the first 400 years of its existence. Uh, the, the Gospel of Thomas, mm -hmm. which is a sayings gospel. Um, it has... All, these sayings of Jesus, that's all it is. It's just sentences, it's just statements by him um, that were, were, were not put into the canon of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mm -hmm. uh, here's a, I'm reading from my book on page 46 just to give people a definition of what Gnosticism is, and there are many definitions. But basically, Gnosticism is the belief that there is an inner personal knowledge and awareness of one's unity with the creation or God, if you prefer, within the consciousness of every individual. This awareness can be tapped into by meditation, by prayer and contemplation. The Greeks called this awareness knowledge or gnosis, and one does not need any member of the clergy or any religious organization to lead one to this knowledge. That is the definition of Gnosticism. But you see how dangerous it was, or it can be, because it takes power away from the clergy, and it gives it to the individual. Mm. Wow. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, Michael, I wanted to uh, mention a couple of, throw a few things at you. you. In the book, you talk about the Elohim, uh, the Nephilim, uh, the Enochian scripture, um, yeah. and Ezekiel as well. Uh, just throwing a few uh, concepts at you. This stuff is alarming. It should scream bells to people, you know. It, it, this stuff is like, you know, off the chart in terms of what we perceive it to be in a religious, spiritual sense. However, if we look at it in terms of... Um, in the extraterrestrial presence or ancient astronaut theory or something like that, it may make more sense or be more believable in a way, Michael. Well, I, again, I think that if we look at what our ancestors were telling us, and I, I, there's a quote I love in the book by Kierkegaard who says that life is lived forward but it can only be understood backwards. Mm -hmm. And that if we look through the lens of the ancient astronaut theory, mm -hmm. what they're trying to tell us is simply that they were in contact with beings from another world. Mm -hmm. And that these beings interacted with people. Some of them were called prophets. Some of these beings were were using the prophets as mouthpieces. Uh, some of them had even ridden in these ships. We talk about the spaceships in Ezekiel. He's describing what what's what's going on with him. Uh, we're talking. We look at Genesis six, 
of four, uh, Enoch goes into more detail, the book of Enoch, when the sons of God, which means the star visitors, made it with the daughters of men, they made it with earth women, and they created a hybrid race. Mm -hmm. It makes perfect sense to me, especially if we take everywhere you see angel in the Bible, because angel just means messenger in Greek. Doesn't mean they had wings. I believe they, they, they had wings. Our ancestors were trying to tell us they could fly. But if you put extraterrestrial everywhere you see angel in the Bible, it certainly makes more sense. Mm. Mm. For sure. You know, sure. we have Jesus telling us, my kingdom is not of this world. He tells us that in the Gospel of John. Now, if his father is not human, and his mother is, then that means Jesus is not human. He's, 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 he's part human. Mm. Mm. Isn't the etymology of angel messenger as well? Yeah, that's what I was saying. A angel means messenger so, in Greek. Wow. Uh, yeah. And the cherubims and the seraphims are angels as well, is that correct? Yes, they're, they're other deities. Wow. You know, it's like we have, it's like what you're portraying, Michael, is a lens, it's an accurate lens. It's like we're, we're able to look back with a focal point and, and you know, kind of with more discerning uh, world view, if you want. Um, yeah, yeah, and, 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 and we look at what's what we see flying in our skies now. We have military people, we have people talking about astronauts, Edgar Mitchell, we have people talking about now, talking about, hey, man, uh, I, I know for a fact that we have been visited, that we're continually being visited. We have Robert Hastings. Uh, he's, he's doing this whole documentary mm -hmm. on UFOs and nukes. Uh, I, I commend his book to you very highly about these beings uh, on occasion have shut down our missile silo. Mm. They shut them down. So uh, these are very, very powerful. Uh, 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 events. Mm -hmm. And these are very powerful beings. And so could these not be the same beings who our ancestors were telling us about? Sure. In the Bible, in the Quran, in, in the Old Testament? Sure. In I the actually, Mahabharata? Yeah, for sure. Oh, totally, Michael. Totally. I agree with you. Yeah, I did a show recently actually on UFOs and nuclear disarmament and uh, Robert Salas was on uh, to name another guest as well. Um, yeah. I totally, I totally with it. You know, I, I do think that, you know, we're going to mess this planet up with nuclear arsenals. Um, I can see why, uh, a different species would come to this planet and disarm us if they were in the vicinity, if we were, you know, me, you know, I look at the vastness of space, Michael, okay, and statistically look at the number of planets, okay, and I statistically think there's, yes, they're, if they had a billion year head start on us, they're, they're going to be more evolved naturally. Um, you know, why wouldn't they be zapping around and flying around different solar systems, scouting for talent, in other words, pl planets, yeah, scouting around for habitats? I mean, if I was a head of a civilization or a, or a part of the, the committee, um, and I was evolved, I would be scouting for other planets because who's to say you're not going to get hit with an asteroid? Who's to say your plan's going to last forever? Of course you're going to want to jump ship for safety. You know, there's a natural reason why people would do that. You know, and, and, and if that's the, if that's the status quo for visitors out there, um, you know, why wouldn't they try and step in and, and sort out the nuclear problem? Because it is a major problem, Michael. And I do think that what a funny time for Roswell to happen, you know, around the 1947 uh, period. Like you say in the book, Nagasaki and uh, the Jap uh, Hiroshima, um, you know, this, this is an incredibly interesting time in this planet. Uh, not a positive time, but an incredibly interesting time, Michael. Well, well, yes, because these, these, these sightings and these contacts picked up after we we split the atom over two civilian cities. Let's be clear. You want to talk about terrorism. Hiroshima and Nagasaki were not military targets. Mm. They were civilian targets. Genocide. And so, you know, and then and then I'm sure it got the attention of other civilizations. And if we're to believe, you know, some of the things that we hear about Eisenhower making a treaty uh, with one race of 
star visitors, but uh, 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 but if we, they're concerned because that's how connected we are. That's how connected we are. And they're probably thinking there's a kid in the backyard playing with a gun. Nothing good is going to come of that. Hmm. For sure. Uh, can you tell us the story of Jacob's ladder, uh, Michael? I think this is incredibly fascinating. Well, basically, J- Jacob is 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 is, is he's falls asleep. He has a dream that he's uh, and in the dream there are beings going up and down a ladder. I interpreted that as angels going up and down on a ship. I mean, from a ship, and he wrestles with one of them, and he wrestles all night. And the, uh, uh, the, he says to the angel, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And the angel touches his, I think touches his thigh, and he becomes limp. And he walks with a gimp, uh, with a limp from that day forth. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Incredibly bizarre story. Um, I, you know, I know a lot of uh, either societies and groups of people refer to Jacob's Ladder story as well. And uh, you mentioned also the Ark of the Covenant in the book. I'm just trying well, to. Well, shoot. also, just Jacob also becomes Israel. Uh, mm. I, I'm sorry. I, uh, in Genesis 35:10, uh, they say God. I think it's an astronaut says, "Your name shall be Jacob." I mean, your name is Jacob, but you will not be called Jacob any longer. From now on, your name will be Israel. Mm-hmm. Now, here we have the makings of the Hebrew, again, the Hebrew religion. Mm-hmm. Remember, there's no Judaism until after the Exodus. Sure, correct. There's no Jewish religion. And here we have the name. Jacob is now named Israel, but he's named that by a star visitor, by an angel. Wow. Wow, it's mind-bending in a way, but not, it's sobering too. Uh, you know, it's mind-bending because we were all taught to believe something else or maybe we've been disimbued from the, the truth or from lack of awareness or whatever, but it's sobering nonetheless. Um, you mentioned also the Ark of the Covenant. I have to mention this. This is incredibly interesting in terms of what it, what it is, what it does, Michael, and... Uh, Maybe just give us a little bit of the the bizarre activities of the Ark of the Covenant. Well, the Ark of the Covenant was a communication device, I believe. We've done certain things on ancient aliens about it, Mm -hmm. where they could communicate with Yahweh. It was made of gold. I mean, he told them how to make it to his specific, um, you know, recommendations. And the people carried it. The, 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 the Hebrew people would carry it with them and they could, could, they could, they would hear his voice. Or maybe there was a hologram or something where they could actually see him. But it's definitely a piece of technology. Now, what was so bizarre about it is that the priest had to wear certain gear and I think that protective gear was to keep them from being from from radiation poisoning, mm. they 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 had to keep their genitals covered. There were hats. There was a vest. They had to wear those types of things. And there's stories in the Bible uh, where Aaron's brothers, Aaron's sons, made a mistake and touched it, and they would fall down dead. They were probably electrocuted. But the 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 the, the Hebrews interpreted it as they found disfavor with God. But you see what I'm saying? They mm-hmm. were trying to use the language of their day. They were into the mindset of their day. And we just know that they probably didn't find disfavor. They probably were just electrocuted. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Bizarre. There's so many. It, it pops up quite a few times in the Ark of the Covenant as well, isn't it? Yes, it really, really does. It's not just um, like a rogue. And, it's not a well, rogue it's story. Captured, it was captured in a battle by the Philistines, but the Philistines... Well, they were dying by the, the thousands, and they probably died from radiation poison. So they wanted to give it back to the Israelites. Get rid they of wanted it. to give it back to the Hebrews because they said, look, this thing is killing us. Wow. Wow. Capture something and then give it back. <laughs> yeah. It's really. crazy. It's wild, this stuff, isn't it? It's wild, but it's, you know, when you look at it from a 21st century perspective, it's not, Michael. That's the key thing I want to point out. Um, yeah. Um, 
Okay, Michael, let's talk about evolution of human consciousness here. I mean, what does this all mean? You know, you, you talk about the anthropomorphic creator in the book and how that can ingest fear. Uh, maybe explain why that is, Michael. I think I think that we make God in our image. And so the God is a jealous God, or we know what God means. God doesn't like those gay people. God doesn't like those black people. God doesn't like those poor white people. God doesn't like Obama. We think we know what this God wants. And as I stated earlier in the show, the finite can never comprehend the infinite. So we make God in our image. God is a man. Because in our image, it has to be a man, because men have all the power. And so I think that that lends a lot of confusion and fear to uh, the way we look at each other and creation. Nature is not something to be cooperated with or worked with. Nature is something to be conquered. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, it's something, so it's fear. If you don't do this, this will happen. If you don't, the knee doesn't bow a certain way. If you don't say things just right, if you don't believe in the exact same way I do, you're going to go to hell. This is, and so it's just fear, 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 fear. And it's very controlling. And we see that it's not working anymore. Maybe it worked at one time. But to me, there's nothing to fear. Einstein said one of the most important questions we'll ask ourselves is, is the universe a friendly place? And so whether you're talking to L.A. Marzulli, who is a more evangelical Christian, he writes about the Nephilim, but it's all this fear. you got to be afraid of them. you got to be afraid of this. And it's, you've got to be afraid of Ebola. Mm -hmm. you got to be afraid of the immigrants coming in. you got to be afraid of ISIS. you got to be afraid of, it's just fear, 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 fear. These are important issues, certainly. Wow. And but, I, but 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 when do we live when sure. we're just taught to fear everything? Sure, I hear you. I hear you. I just had L.A. Marzulli on the show, by the way. Yeah, I know you did. That's why I brought him up. Wow, thank you for that. <laughs> but it's just fear. Well, that's why I'm it's so looking forward to today's show, Michael, because you're such a gracious soul and an intelligence, Sean, and I love the I love what you have to to give us, Michael, and you are giving a great service to the world. I mean. Uh, just for the listeners, don't take my word for our Michaels. Read the book. Uh, I will say at the start of the book, there is a, a compiled list of interesting scriptures, uh, information in the scriptures that pertains to what we're talking about. Uh, it's well documented. It's by no means a definitive list, uh, as you say, Michael, in the book, but it's, it's great to see that in a compiled list, Michael. I'm, I'm a list maker. I like lists. So, um, well, I, I wish I, sometimes I think I should have put it in the first book. But I got it in here, and I think it'll give people, um, you know, ju just to get them thinking. That's Some people all. need that, Michael, and I think you did, you did credit to the book for that, because uh, me too. It's not that I need it, but it's nice when I see it, because it helps me. I'm there quicker. I I'm moving along faster. You know, I'm accepting yeah. more. Because I want people to know that, A, you don't have to have visits from people from other planets to tell you the things that I'm telling you. It, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying this is part of my story. But, and I'm not, I'm not anti-religious. Believe me, I'm not. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm just trying to say that basically we're here to learn to love. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I'll know what you believe by how you treat me. You can go to church every Wednesday night for Bible study. You can go to the temple on Friday for Shabbos. Or, you know, you can go to the mosque on Friday and what have you. That's all lovely. But we all know people who do all the right things, but sometimes they're the most bigoted, uh, hurtful people that you can, you can come across. But yet they go to church all the time. And so I say that I know what you believe by the way you treat me and the way you treat this planet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much about what you say, it's about what you do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Michael, this one's for your chance with the readers. Uh, you talk about atheism, spirituality, and faith in the book. You tackle yes. these three concepts and what one really actually do, means in its, in its true uh, definition or context and how they relate to each other. Um, because if there's readers out there that may be atheists, there may be readers out there that are into spirituality, and there may be readers out there that are in the faith. So 
maybe this is your chance to talk to the director and kind of maybe explain these concepts. Well, I I happen to think that everybody has faith in something. Mm. And I don't want to trivialize it, but you know, when you're in your automobile, you have faith that the other person's going to stay in their lane while you're driving down the street. We all have faith in something. Sure. What I started thinking about was that and at one time I, I, I called myself an atheist. I was so disgusted with uh, the Bible and Christianity. But a, a, a lot of atheists, they're not hostile to religion. They're not hostile to Christianity. But what they're saying is, I don't know if there's a God or not. Now, some people will say, I don't believe in God. Fine. I know people who don't believe in God that will treat you better than people who do. But what they're saying is, many of them are saying, I don't know if there's a God, but I don't believe in the God that you believe in. I don't believe in Santa Claus up in the sky. I don't believe in someone who's going to come and barbecue me because I don't believe the same way they do. I don't believe in a God who's going to kill all the firstborn children just to prove a point. I don't believe in a God who's going to tell uh, the, 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 the Hebrews to go into the land of milk and honey and kill all the men, women, and children. That's what they're saying. They say, they're saying, I don't, I may not believe in God, or I may not even know. I'm an agnostic. I don't know if there's a God, but I know I can't believe in someone who would do that. And I have to say, I agree with them. Hmm. Wow. Beautifully spoken, Michael. Beautifully spoken. Michael, at the end of the show, I've got one last question for you. I have to mention this. The Talmud of Jemmanuel. I mean, I'd never even heard of this before, Michael. Now, I know, I know. It's a fantastic book. Uh, some people say that the jury's still out on Billy Meyer. I think that he's on to something. Um, he is a Swiss farmer. He has one arm. You can Google him, Billy Meyer. Mm -hmm. uh, but he, he and a guy named Rashid, who was assassinated, discovered uh, uh, the book of Matthew, but it's written from... Um, it's written from a star person's point of view, mm -hmm. where Jesus is born of a, uh, Gabriel's his father, uh, literally. Uh, he t he's a teacher of reincarnation. He's a teacher of wisdom. He's not a teacher of b saving souls. And uh, you can buy it on Amazon. Uh, it, it may be some astrological amount of money now, mm -hmm. but it, it, in other words, it's an extraterrestrial view of the, the math, uh, uh, Matthew's gospel. Jesus is called Emmanuel. He's called, uh, well, spelled with a J. But, you know, here's something that we probably never even thought of. Uh, you know, Jesus, in, in Isaiah 7, 14, it says, <coughs> pardon me, Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. In Matthew, verse 1, uh, chapter 1, 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. How do we get, how did Emmanuel turn into Jesus? But we don't ask those questions. It says right here in the scriptures, his name shall be called Emmanuel. But we, somehow, his name is called Jesus. And Emmanuel means, according to the Palladians, the one with godly knowledge. Wow. And it's spelled J. M M A N U E L, mm -hmm. and it's pronounced Jemmanuel. Now, that is I, I I can't tell you how important this book is. Mm -hmm. So, to the readers and listeners, it, it Jesus survives the crucifixion. Uh, he goes to India with his wife Mary and his mother. <clears throat> the teachings uh, make so much more sense in the Talmud than they do sometimes in Matthew. And, and you know, some people say it's a hoax. But if it is, they'd have to be a genius 
to to be able to go through the whole book of Matthew. And it's translated from Aramaic. Uh, it's it, One page has the German, because Billy Meyer is Swiss German, mm -hmm. and it has the translation from the Aramaic. Um, I, I, it, it's, it's worth a read, but it will give you a whole different perspective on the ministry of Jemmanuel, whom we call Jesus. He is a teacher of wisdom. He says that there is a God, but this God is extraterrestrial. Above this God is something called creation, and that's what we call, what, what, what he calls God, he calls it creation. He says there is at, there are astronauts, and they are gods, and that some of them are the gods of the human races, but above that God is something called creation which is the all that is. Very different message from what we've been getting through religion. Very different message. And he comes out and he says that my father is Gabriel. He calls him, he's, he's one of the celestial sons. Fascinating, Michael, fascinating. Michael, we're at the end of the show. It's been great talking to you. It really has. Your website again is michaeljscarter.com. You can catch your previous book there, Alien Scriptures, Extraterrestrials in the Holy Bible. Today's book today we were reviewing was A New World If You Can Take It. Um, Michael, come back anytime. You know, it's always, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. And you're such a gracious, intelligent soul. And, uh, it, it's a great conversation today. It really has been. So I really appreciate your time today. James, I thank you so much. I want you to know that I'm a big fan. You know, we're, 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 we're big fans of each other. I wish you a long and happy life with Zana. Oh, and, uh, let's, let's be in touch. Thank you, brother. You take care. I hope to see you at this time in the world in the, in the not too distant future. Yes, brother. Have a wonderful holiday season. Merry Christmas. Oh, thank you, brother. All right.